Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending this uh, weekly research round. Um, so today, we, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Mark Duell. Well, I don't, I'm not sure he really needs an introduction for, uh, for the audience, uh, but, may, but it's always important to remind everyone the, um, the quality and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the level of our speakers. So Mark, as you know, is the, the division head of the Cardiac Surgery at the Heart Institute. So he received his MD degree in 1994 in, uh, in Ottawa, and then his uh, certification as a heart surgeon by Royal College in 2000. I was, uh, I, he, he, uh, he followed with um, a fellowship in Harvard Medical School where he, he combined research in invasive surgery and, um, and uh, basic science, uh, regenerative uh, uh, therapies, and also in public health. So he has an MPH in public health. So he has a lot of skills, obviously, in community epidemiology. So I was uh, very pleased to recruit Mark actually in 2002 uh, to the Heart Institute. And um, since then, I would say his career has continuously expanded. Uh, he has developed uh, a great, great program of immunization basic surgery. And that's really the talk about today. In particular, for coronary surgery, he, he has also introduced robotic uh, coronary surgery at the Heart Institute. He's definitely a world leader uh, in, the, in the field of uh, minimally invasive surgery and coronary uh, surgery in particular. So uh, he has, of course, uh, a number of publications, which is uh, astronomic, if I may say, like uh, over 400. He has. Uh, He's actually also uh, it's a great honor uh, to be the president of the, the CCS, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. And as we call, I think there is only two or three uh, uh, cardiac surgeons who have been presiding to this, uh, to this uh, prestigious uh, society, which is the number one society for cardiovascular uh, uh, disease and research in Canada. And he also has prominent roles in uh, important international uh, society like the American Association for Plastic Surgery, the Society of Plastic Surgery. So I could spend a lot, a lot more time to, uh, to talk about his achievements, but uh, I think we're more interested to hear what Mark has to say about the invasive cardiac surgery. And just as a reminder, there is a QA and a uh, item that you can use for your questions that I would, I would relay at the end of the talk. And uh, at the end of the talk, you, you, talk, you can also ask questions by raising your hands. So welcome, uh, Mark, and uh, very excited to hear about what you have to say on minimum project. So thank you. Merci beaucoup, Thierry. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'entendre correctement? Yeah, we do. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Messana, uh, for the kind introduction and, and, and the support uh, of so many people at the Heart Institute and beyond for uh, almost uh, 20 years now and more than 20 years if you include residency. Uh, it's really, uh, it's such a, an honor to be uh, practicing in our institution. I think there's really uh, still a magic around the Heart Institute and, and our mission statements of being a, a, an institute of excellence in Canada uh, with ramifications towards uh, not only improving what we do internally, but our outreach externally is a very relevant one. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, is our path in, in developing minimal invasive cardiac surgery uh, at the Heart Institute and how we've tried to make this uh, a national and international program with, with some uh, wider impact. So I have the following disclosures. Um, I'm a proctor for Medtronic. Uh, I'm on steering committee for Cryolife. Uh, Abbott uh, is out of core therapeutics, which is a new up and coming uh, angiogenesis uh, uh, company. And uh, I have a employment with the American Heart as associate editor for circulation too. So um, we surgeons, and I know there are some surgeons in the audience and, and uh, and some of you may relate to, uh, to this kind of unrealistic expectation um, weight that's being thrown upon us. We are often told that we're responsible for the skin and its contents, right? And, and sometimes I joke with uh, 
Dr. Gleaner on Friday night when we were about to go home. And I said, you know, don't you feel sometimes that you're about to go on the weekend and there's thousands of patients walking around Ottawa and beyond who, in whom something could happen, right? Something could go wrong. And, but it, I think it does reflect uh, the responsibility that comes with, with surgery. And I think you have to make it a positive rather than uh, a burden. So we often say that surgeons have to be able, available, and affable. Uh, these are obviously Canadian idols. I'm not talking about the, uh, the reality show, but rather about uh, Frederick Banting and Charles Best. Uh, Banting being on the right-hand side, who was a surgeon? Uh, not uh, everybody knows that. Uh, and obviously with Best, his fellow, the discoverers of insulin. There's quite an interesting story about this, uh, but it's, I think it, it, for us surgeons, it depicts uh, the impact that surgeons can have on medicine in general. And I'll, I'll tell you a couple of examples where this has been so central to what we do today. Uh, about a couple of years ago, I got this magazine through the mail. Uh, uh, one day I had the fortune of publishing an opinion piece with the Methodist Debate Cardiovascular Journal. So they keep sending me uh, their uh, semi-monthly publication. And I got this picture of Marjorie the dog. And I wonder, what, what, what is this about? And it was so uh, nice for us Canadians to see that um, essentially a Canadian discovery, one of the most important of medicine and uh, led by a surgeon, uh, was featured on the cover of uh, a texture journal, essentially, right? And Marjorie the dog, who was the first successful recipient long-term of insulin. And um, they gave Marjorie a pancreatic extract after they had the ligated the, uh, the pancreatic duct and, and sustained her for 70 days to treat her induced diabetes. And the rest is, is history. Uh, however, obviously the contract for us is not easy. It's a, a, we all feel this. Uh, we look at the JCI or Nature Papers from 20 years ago and think, well, we could have done this, right? The, the reality is that scientific knowledge is cumulative. There's way, way more uh, scientific knowledge uh, from uh, the average college student nowadays than anything that Aristotle, for instance, would have dreamt of knowing. So this means that the contracts that we have to deal with in terms of tracing our paths are, are more difficult. The expectations are higher and it's a more competitive world for children. And I think we all realize that. So some of the contributions of surgeons uh, around aseptic technique and hygiene, uh, management of trauma, resuscitation, transfusion medicine, organ transplant, mechanical organ development, uh, one, um, aspect when I was in Boston, uh, really a, a, a very important figure to all of us uh, was Judah Falkman, who was a surgeon himself, um, who was working at Boston Children and discovered from Boston samples, uh, the concept of uh, angiogenesis and anti-angiogenesis, essentially by discovering fibroblast growth factor and vascular endothelial growth factor uh, from uh, pleural effusions of patients uh, with neoplastic syndromes, et cetera, was able to aim at uh, uh, anti-angiogenesis. And, and from that field then was born uh, angiogenesis and cell-based therapy, which uh, Dr. Saronin and Arla Khan are, are conducting in, in our lab here at the Heart Institute. Uh, cancer therapeutics obviously were largely led by surgeons as well, and we still have examples at the TOH uh, with Dr. Auer and, and many others uh, programs. Um, artificial tissues and engineering are often developed by surgeons and robots, as well as several catheter-based platforms uh, have their origin through a surgical thinking. So it, it, it's really, there's a, we're all standing on, on the shoulders of huge giants and, and our contributions are a tiny increment uh, to a field that's already have had so much inventiveness to it. So here are my personal perspective, my attempts, what I've tried to do in, in, in 19 years on faculty at the Heart Institute. I've tried to foster excellence in our cardiac surgery division and beyond it, uh, especially as I'm uh, getting older, uh, looking at I mean, even more and more at the big picture. Uh, furthering our field of cardiac surgery by enabling better outcomes and lesser invasion, which I'll try to show to you is remains a problem in cardiac surgery, the concept of invasiveness, and, and also bring a credible role, a, 
appropriate role for surgeons in a broad cardiovascular team, which really traditionally was not always something that was espoused because surgeons were so busy and operating 12 hours a day and being on call and always exhausted and not really uh, giving time to developing the broader cardiovascular field. And I think this is something where uh, we have to be involved because of the reasons that I've shown you so far and, and the importance of cardiac surgery in the whole cardiovascular area. And, and finally, uh, my passion in the lab uh, dating from uh, times with Dr. Selke and Falkman, uh, who uh, uh, I was showing you before, was to address cardiac organ loss through angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. So our, our team really is fantastic. I like whenever I present to talk about or, or cardiac surgery division. And, and I really think, uh, thanks to all of you and the environment of the Heart Institute that we have one of the strongest cardiac surgery divisions in the world. And I 100% I mean this. So, uh, you know, many of the surgeons here, uh, these are the eight uh, uh, surgeons who uh, are my colleagues in, in performing uh, uh, faculty slash open heart operations at the Heart Institute. And this young lad with Dr. Maharaj is not a surgeon, at least not yet, but uh, I'm sure one day uh, will be considering such a profession. And, and we also have a wonderful uh, array of trainees. These are our current uh, trainees um, who are essentially our five residents and our two fellows, uh, Dr. K Shahinian and Dr. Qureshi. Um, um, again, posing for uh, uh, really completing the team cardiac surgery. We also have uh, nimble and smart OR assistants, uh, Dr. Almistikawi, Dr. Lapierre, Dr. Ressler, and Dr. Sato, who's shown, uh, scrubbed here. And very central to our research endeavor, because these are research rounds, are our research team. We, again, we are small, uh, but we are nimble. We have a highly performing uh, staff uh, doing our research. And I know the or research rounds and Christmas um, uh, events have uh, often uh, underlined their, their contributions. So Suzanne, uh, Mary, and Asmat uh, working with our research. I also want to highlight the, the role of our senior surgeons who have uh, paved the way and who are still uh, appointed in our division at the Heart Institute, Dr. Paul Henry, who was uh, pioneering with regards to VAD development. Dr. Roy Masters, who is now incidentally and very in, in, importantly or quality lead for the entire division of cardiac surgery and dedicates great skill and energy to this. And, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Cherry Messana, who um, is shown here, who uh, is now as essentially left our division because he's taken a this role that you may have heard of, uh, i.e. being CEO of the Heart Institute. And we, we thank Cherry for uh, uh, the recruitment of many members and, and furthering our division over the 10 years that he was uh, at, at the head of the Division of Cardiac Sur Surgery. We also have an organ loss research program to uh, a little bit to what I was alluding to earlier. And, and I'm really happy to be surrounded uh, by a team of people who are much smarter than I am and, and who have taken this on uh, after having founding it back in 2002 and really built a program. Uh, to give you an example, currently we have five postdoctoral fellows, four PhD students, five MSc students who have graduated from the lab uh, seven undergraduate students and two research uh, technicians. So um, really um, quite a, a lot of activity and funding uh, in our organ loss research program. So back to the main topic of this uh, presentation, why minimal invasive cardiac surgery? So you've heard of heart surgery and, and you may know that there are two um, whether they're real or perceived, but there are two problems with what people call open heart surgery. First one is uh, when you stop the heart and, and open the heart, that in itself can lead to complications in some instances, although it generally is very, very safe. And the second one is the incision that we use, it's called a sternotomy, uh, i.e. cutting the breastbone, uh, which definitely leads to invasion. So the sternotomy is an incision that has been used since uh, the mid 1960s, actually early 1960s, uh, when uh, valve surgery and bypass surgery was designed. And essentially, the incision has not changed uh, whatsoever from what it was 50 years ago. Our minimal invasive cardiac surgery program has essentially focused on trying to avoid um, breastbone incisions in, in patients and, and essentially uh, perform uh, surgeries without cutting the breastbone. So going between ribs and not cutting any bone uh, as a result. 
So one reason for that may be that uh, the recovery from cardiac surgery is not a small undertaking. In fact, if you looked at comparative studies, for instance, this is a quality of life sub-analysis from the Freedom trial, which was an important trial that compared um, stents versus surgery in patients with diabetes. And in this quality of life and analysis, there was an advantage for surgery with regards to angina frequency, the, the occurrence of chest pain, uh, starting 12 to 24 months after surgery. However, there was already a physical limitation initially in the surgery group, minus uh, negative numbers denoting um, drawbacks in the, in the surgery versus the the stenting group, and only to get better at 12 to 14 months because of enhanced freedom from angina in the surgery patients. When you put all this together, you can compare stents, which are the empty dots, versus bypass surgery, which are, which are the full dots, but, and all the bypass surgery surgeries were performed via the breastbone. You can see that there's really a six months price to pay with any form of sternotomy, and there's other data that has confirmed this. So the recuperation from open heart surgery is not a month or two, it is already six months. Further, uh, there's about the 30% incidence of patients who don't really heal their breastbone. You know, I, I like to often repeat that we're cutting a big bone right in the front of the chest, which moves with every breath in people who have osteoporosis uh, processes going on. Uh, at the same time. So you can expect that the healing, the union from the bone, the, the healing, the fracture, if you will, is not going to be perfect in everybody. And I think the number here is about 30%. Uh, there are several analyses that have been done in low risk patients, for instance, who didn't even have bypass surgery, but had valve surgery, which is easier on the sternum because we don't take the arteries from the underside of the sternum. Regardless, there was about 34% in whom the, the bone was not healed at 18 months. Uh, other studies have compared one technique versus another of using stainless steel wires around the sternotomy. And again, look at that number. About 30% at least of patients uh, don't already heal their sternum, don't have bone union, bone formation that completes the healing by six months after surgery. Furthermore, there's a certain percentage of patients who have chronic pain in their sternotomy. And I think our cardiology colleagues uh, would attest to that because they see the patients long-term and, and family doctors do as well. And, and that number seems to be around 28% or so. So again, close to the 30% um, incomplete healing. So it's, it's not nothing. When you're, you're considering that about close to a third of patients will have some uh, chronic issue with their incision, I think something has to be addressed. So in surgery, we have largely not really addressed it. Uh, the, uh, this is a bit of a joke, obviously, this, this picture. It's the same picture, one in black and white and one in color, but it depicts that we're not really moving forward. We don't really know where we are inside the stomach of the snake, if you will. Uh, we've added um, uh, more use of chest wall arteries, more arterial grafts, but the incision remains largely the same. So how can we preserve the safety and efficacy of bypass surgery. I'm not going into effectiveness data today because that's outside the scope of our presentation, but assume uh, for the purpose of this presentation that bypass surgery remains a very effective operation. And I can attest to you that it is, there's even a resurgence uh, with regards to its well-demonstrated effectiveness over other modalities. How can we preserve that effectiveness in a less invasive operation? that a surgeon and a team can learn and perform routinely. So we were at the drawing board back in the early 2000s uh, as I, I was a young surgeon then. And, and we, uh, uh, Joe McGinn and I, uh, with the help of, of Medtronic and, and other surgeons, Franz Sutter was there as well, um, did a cadaver lab uh, in Minnesota, if I, my, my, my remembrance is right, and spent a weekend And, and spent a weekend working on cadaver models and seeing how uh, we could perhaps approach uh, the heart and, and be, perform, be able to perform multi-bypass grafting uh, onto the, the heart without opening the breastbone. 
And this led essentially to the first iteration of these operations. This is an old picture back from 2005 as we were maneuvering our first incisions. We did not even have a proper retractor at the time and, and trying to isolate not only the left internal thoracic artery, which is an artery from the chest wall and put it onto the uh, left anterior descending artery, but also start grafting other vessels around the heart. And essentially the heart has three main arteries around it. And if you can get to all three, then you're usually able to accomplish complete revascularization. So this was a schematic depiction of uh, our operation as it was developing. And, and essentially, what do you need? And obviously this is not a surgery course, but what are the basic things that are needed to perform multivessel bypass via a small thoracotomy, avoiding the breast bone? So you need a fancy retractor system. Uh, this uh, Medtronic Thoratrack system was developed and combined with a pulley type of system that you see on the right-hand side. Uh, you need some way to stabilize the epicardium. So the epicardium is the fat on top of the heart, which surrounds the artery to be bypassed. And that artery is very small. It's usually 1.5 to 2 millimeters. So obviously to put 12 to 14 stitches around it, you need it to be stable because if there's a, a gross movement of it, uh, precision will not be possible. You need to also be able to uh, position the heart within the closed chest. So the incision we are making with this uh, uh, operation is about five centimeters. So the concept is not that the incision will be providing you access to the entire heart, but rather that you will displace the heart uh, in areas of need throughout the incision, which essentially becomes a window. So in order to do that, you need some way to position the heart within the closed chest. I think you need a good surgical eye, you need capable hands, obviously like any form of complex surgery. And first and above everything, you need a great surgical team. And, and I'll provide my thanks to, to our team on my last slide of this presentation, because as my son likes to say, uh, Papa, did you ever do an operation on your own? And that is absolutely impossible in cardiac surgery. You may be able to stitch up a wound in the emergency department uh, after a dog bite or something, but cardiac surgery cannot be done unless you have a great team uh, supporting you. And I cannot overemphasize that point. So usually when I present about the development of these operations, I, I talk about the step-by-step uh, -step processes around it. I'm not going to, to go into great details today. Perhaps some of you are eating lunch. I will have a couple of graphic, uh, I find them beautiful, uh, but not everyone may agree, uh, graphic depiction and videos of how we do this operation. I like to separate it by four chapters, uh, just to make it a little bit simpler uh, to approach uh, for each surgery. First, I position the patient, then I take down the LETA, which is the left internal thoracic artery, which is a, a very important artery to go on the front of the heart and provide a very robust life-saving bypass. Then we perform what's called the proximal anastomosis, where we um, give a source to each of the bypasses, either the radial artery or a vein graft from the aorta in order to then be connected and replace the artery that is blocked in a given patient. And finally, we do the distal anastomosis, and I'll show you this by uh, some short videos. So I, I like to uh, flip the patient on the side um, in order to perform the incision. I usually use a, a triangle between uh, the sternal angle and the xiphoid process, which is the bottom of the breastbone, the bottom of the sternum, and I'm dipping you to dipping this uh, this here. As you can see, the sternal angle and, and kind of an isocele triangle, and showing you where the incision has to be done. And, and I can tell you uh, that this will provide uh, the appropriate space. Uh, to enter the closed chest cavity in about 90% of patients. And once I'm in, I put this retractor that you see, and, and I use my finger to really verify that I'm, the, uh, I'm in the right space to perform the operation. I like to emphasize to my surgeon colleagues that if you're not in the right space, do not hesitate uh, to move up or down one space. It's much better than doing a whole operation, not having perfect exposure. Uh, this is an example of a dissection, or we call it takedown in surgery, of the left internal thoracic artery. You can see how the uh, visibility is wonderful. This is, again, a four to five centimeter incision, so things are hugely magnified. This is the left internal thoracic artery, that lita I was referring to, uh, after it's been harvested. And I'm just now detaching it a little bit further from uh, the uh, rear side of the sternum. 
Once you've done that, you, you, the leader is ready now. You want to expose the ascending aorta, uh, which is the exit from the heart, and, and connect your bypasses onto it. You can use a radial artery. You can use a vein. So I like to really mobilize. Again, use the window concept uh, to bring the ascending aorta into play. You can see here I have a number of exposure techniques. Uh, I put a, this uh, sponge is called a four by four. I put it in front of the superior vena cava and that brings the aorta a little bit more towards me. There's about 10 steps or so that each give you a couple of millimeters. And finally, you're able to, to suture onto the aorta. Another, another of those steps is to depress the pulmonary artery. This is pulmonary artery here next to the aorta. So, uh, and, and essentially uh, you can help expose this way. And once you're ready in good position and you're well exposed, then you can put a, a sight lamp onto the ascending aorta and suture uh, your future grafts uh, as you can be seeing here. Once they have been sutured, I like to mark them to keep the orientation because the window is so small, being four to five centimeters, there's no way if you don't mark them that you'll be able to be certain of the orientation over the entire length of the conduit. So uh, you mark it and you follow that blue line and, and then you, you, you keep your direction uh, as you move towards performing the distal anastomosis. Now to do the distal anastomosis, this is a clever suction cup, which essentially we attach it. This is not NASA level uh, or grade technology. It's very rudimentary, but it works. Uh, we attach it with what we call an umbilical tape and essentially we put that on the section of the heart that needs to be mobilized in order to bring the territory of interest inside the window for suturing. And as you can see here, that suction cup is there on the left-hand side, uh, upper corner. And then there's a epicardial stabilizer here. And you can see the coronary artery vessel that is to be grafted. And look at the amount of stability that we get from this tiny little exposure. And this is magnified about sixfold or so. And, and this artery is 1.5 millimeter here. And, and, and you're now building a new artery around the heart with full control and, and very nice exposure in my opinion. At the end, this new artery has been created now. Uh, and, and you can see how it's now perfusing the heart before I'm, I'm going to release uh, the uh, exposure tools. At the end, we leave a chest tube. And this is uh, this uh, uh, very nice gentleman consented to uh, using his picture for purposes of, of this talk and publication. Uh, and this is an example. This gentleman had an endoscopic radial artery harvest performed by uh, Dr. Lapierre, who, whose picture I showed earlier, and had a multi-bypass grafting using several arteries uh, around the heart performed through a small incision here. So we celebrated uh, the, the first 10 years of this operation. It wasn't always uh, easy moments. You can imagine some operations when we started would take six, seven hours, uh, but we, we really got it to a very working uh, uh, thing uh, down the road. And this is uh, Joe McGinn, my colleague and friend uh, from New York who co-started this back in 2005. Uh, uh, and and we, we shared information over the years and did studies together around this. Um, so, so far, we now have uh, over 500 patients who have received this operation with a mean age of 64 years old. Uh, the overwhelming majority of patients is, is male, and this is something that we, we're uh, addressing. Um, it is a little bit easier to not have to deal with the breast because that incision is exactly where the breast uh, falls usually. But the results in women, I would argue, are even better uh, because of the cosmetic advantage of the breast falling over the incision and, and essentially uh, the incision not being visible whatsoever. Uh, we had 27% of patients who had diabetes and 18% of patients who had uh, significant left ventricular dysfunction. We used uh, a pump assistance, so cardiopulmonary bypass in about 16% uh, of patients. And we had to convert to 4% of patients to a regular breastbone incision. So uh, 10 were in the early experience and another 10 subsequently as, as the rhythm really picked up uh, with this operation. Uh, the median number of grafts was two, uh, ranging between one and four grafts. And we had 1.6% of patients who needed to uh, go back to the OR because of usually uh, bleeding. That was troublesome. Uh, very good results with regards to hard endpoints such as stroke. We had one, uh, one um, we had seven 
um, major adverse cardiac events like a periop MI or so. And we had one 30 day mortality with this operation. And I'll remember uh, this poor gentleman very well. He was picking up his bag, it's going home on post-op day four, doing great. He was over 80 years old and then collapsed from a massive pulmonary embolus, which is a, something that all surgeons dread and have seen in their career and which unfortunately happened to this man. Uh, so we've also had a number of papers on this and, and moved the needle forward uh, from a, a community point of view and, and developing and having this surgery accepted. So I would like to highlight a few. Uh, our first report of feasibility with this operation was published in circulation back in 2009. Uh, that paper has been cited uh, 200 times since. And, and I, again, I wanna um, commend the uh, uh, foresight of circulation to uh, publish a, a surgical paper at the time about a completely new surgical technique, which was not something that they would often do. Um, we then later on looked at a case match comparison versus sternotomy uh, off pump surgery, so versus an incision through the breastbone. I'll give you a couple of examples uh, around this publication. Uh, we matched 150 patients who had a breastbone incision, i.e. median sternotomy, to 150 patients who were operated via the small left approach that I showed you. And, and essentially, we showed no difference in terms of hard outcomes with uh, good results in both groups. However, the main two differences were that with this small incision, you really don't uh, essentially get infections. You may get an occasional superficial infection as is denoted here, two patients had one. And the mean time to return to full physical activity is also much faster. It was 36 days in the breastbone incision versus 12 days in, in the uh, mixed cabbage, so small thoracotomy incision. We then later on, uh, Dr. Chan, Vincent Chan was the first author of the first report of our proximal anastomosis technique. And there were also questions around graft patency. How many of those grafts are, are remaining open over the long term? So we studied this with the help of Medtronic, Joe, McGinn, and, and I, and our teams uh, really got together and looked at this uh, in a consecutive series of patients in a prospectively uh, registered study. So these are the data here, essentially showing that the graph patency uh, was overall quite good at 91.5% and, and no uh, loss of the left internal thoracic artery. The beauty with this operation is essentially you take away the breastbone incision, but the rest of the operation is the same, as can be depicted here on this CT scan re uh, reconstruction. You have new bypasses around the heart the same way that you would have if you had done a full incision for the patient. And again, here showing a CT scan of a vein graft to the PDA, which is a branch of the right coronary artery, or to the circumflex vessel. Um, one issue remains a uh, learning curve is the operation teachable. And, and we've examined this in, in several publications, uh, which I would like to highlight. So we wanted to look at, is there an intra-op learning curve? Is there a way to make the operation a little bit easier? And, and we also wanted to look at the impact of didactic visits uh, through our peer-to-peer -peer program at the Ottawa Heart Institute. So uh, we use a number of methods around that, which I'll spare in the address of time. But just to uh, summarize, essentially, if we compared um, patients in whom we used uh, pump assistance versus those in whom we were performing the surgery entirely off pump, uh, we saw that there was actually a mitigation of the learning curve. And what I mean by this, if you look on the left-hand side, you see that there's clearly a learning curve with regards to operative time in patients in whom the heart was kept beating and unsupported the entire time. However, if you go on the right-hand side and look at those patients where the, uh, there was support with the cardiopulmonary by bypass, you can see that there's really stability with regards to the operative time. Uh, for these patients. So these are not heart outcomes. They're not strokes or, or mortality or myocardial infarction, but they do show that it's a little bit easier for the surgeon to use uh, the pump in order to decompress the heart and enable this small incision surgery. We also looked at the impact, and I have not updated these data since 2014, uh, but it was quite interesting. At the time, we had had 31 peer-to-peer sessions, meaning a visiting surgeon coming to the heart institute um, uh, versus 276 patients who had had their operation outside of this. And we wanted to know, uh, is this fraught with potential risk 
for the patient to actually have a peer-to-peer -peer session. And we were happy to see uh, that it's not. We compared the number of graphs, which essentially was similar, probably a little more with the peer-to-peer -peer sessions because we usually tend to uh, keep uh, patients requiring more graphs for uh, uh, demonstration, if you will. Um, and the outcomes were, were quite good. We had teams coming from Canada, from the US, from Japan, from India with uh, take, uh, uptake of the surgery uh, in those respective jurisdictions. And, and really no, uh, no difference in terms of a, a conversion, reopening, and, and the number of deaths uh, remained uh, at zero at the time. So we also um, engage in outreach. And again, with the support of the Heart Institute and, and Medtronic to build a community uh, for this uh, uh, new surgical technique. And, and I would say uh, those tribulations have taken me to uh, other Canadian centers, but also to uh, countries such as uh, India and, and Japan and Singapore. So uh, India has been really an eye-opening experience uh, for me. I fell in love with, with India and the Indian people, and, and I feel for them right now in the midst of their, their pandemic, which is so uh, incredibly uh, gruesome uh, on, on their country. Uh, but India has so much talent within the country, as you can imagine, and, and it was really uh, amazing to see Indian surgeons uh, taking on this operation uh, so rapidly and so competently. Uh, and, and I did to quote in, in, in the newspaper that Indian doctors are quick learners, and I really uh, did mean uh, what I was saying at the time. Uh, this guy, Gopicham Manam, pictured here with me, uh, saw it in the morning and did the operation in the afternoon, which, which I was absolutely flagger-blasted. Uh, Japan has also been uh, a major uh, adopter, as was Germany uh, and other countries. Uh, of Europe and Belgium and France uh, of this operation. Uh, Sakakibara Heart Institute is a little bit like our institution in, uh, in Japan. It's the largest heart institute in Japan and it is a dedicated heart institute in Tokyo. So a lot of parallels with the Ottawa Heart Institute. And, and I was so glad to be uh, their visiting professor performing surgeries there. And a little anecdote that you may find amusing is that when you go to Japan and you walk around the corridors, uh, you see more helmet stations than you see fire extinguishers or, or even eye washing stations. Uh, and, and obviously the reason, it's a little surprising at first, but the reason is that they're they could have the big one, uh, if you will, any day. Uh, so you walk around the hospital and you have helmet stations in case that the big earthquake uh, happens uh, down your way. Certainly not something that we are experiencing here. Um, very interesting surgeries there. Again, a, a lot of uh, dedication from Japanese teams in, in undertaking and uptaking this, this operation. And this man here, uh, whose uh, shoulder my hand is on, uh, became a fantastic champion of this operation, uh, Dr. Keita Kikuchi, who uh, it's, it's the, be the beauty of teaching surgery is when you, you teach something and you see your pupil becoming better at it uh, than you are yourself. And, and I, I don't think there's too many things that are more satisfying. And Keita here uh, pictured with some of the uh, uh, additions and inventions that he brought on to the surgery to make it easier to do. And we use some of these techniques every day when we perform this operation. Uh, one other paper was highlighting whether it's time for the robot. And I wanna move into uh, perhaps a, a different dimension. One great way to perform the surgery is with the robotic assistance. And as some of you may know, uh, we have uh, three dedicated uh, robotic surgeons at the Heart Institute, and we have a very uh, vibrant uh, robotic program and dedicated to cardiac surgery as well. Our, our robot really waits for either Dr. Gleaner or Dr. Chan or yours truly uh, to be calling the team on to, to perform uh, operations. And I think that is, a, that is a great asset because it is a boutique program. It is an exclusive program, and, and it's a tremendously uh, impactful and, and forward uh, looking. I want to thank in passing uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. McGarvey, uh, who uh, graciously uh, donated uh, the robotic infrastructure uh, through his wife, Sandra, and their Crabtree Foundation. And we are tremendously indebted uh, to their support of the Ottawa Minimal Invasive Cardiac Surgery Program, and more specifically, the robotic program. I think Mr. McGarvey might be present. Uh, we certainly extended an invitation to, to him 
uh, for these research rounds today. So this is an example of what the robot do, does. Rather than, than having to extend the chest and find your way, you can actually you have miniaturized hands. And this is magnified tenfold. So these little wrists that you see there are essentially only about one to two centimeters in length. And you can work within the closed chest and, and really go in challenging areas and take down the arteries from the chest wall and, and really have a beautiful result as a result. Um, so mixed cabbage still has research questions, in my opinion. Uh, I think there are three that we are tackling right now. Uh, definitely, there's a role for surgical education here, but is it widely diffusible? Is it uh, going to remain a niche technique, even though the numbers of surgeons and teams and centers performing this has multiplied many fold? Uh, is it uh, approachable? Is it conceivable that this becomes the routine uh, cardiac surgery operation. I think we're still a couple of degrees of separation from that. Uh, is the operation robust and durable like conventional breastbone incision coronary bypass grafting? And is it truly less invasive? Even though you may think so, there's actually very little data showing that uh, those little incisions between the ribs on the left chest are really better than doing the full uh, sternotomy incision. So answering the first one, I think uh, we see that definitely there's been a wide uptake, uh, more than 20 fold in single vessel bypass uh, in large part as a result of the combined experience that I'm presenting you today, as well as something called hybrid coronary revascularization, where you would do a single bypass to the front, which is easier to do than going on all the arteries and complete the revascularization with stents. And there's also been uh, close to tenfold increase in the use of multi-vessel small thoracotomy. This is what MVST stands for, with centers of excellence in Chicago, Miami, Wisconsin, in China, India, Japan, uh, Ottawa, Germany, Belgium, Singapore, Russia, and others. So to answer the question as to whether it's robust and durable, we now have followed uh, all our patients uh, over uh, more than 10 years with a mean follow-up of exceeding six years, including the entire cohort. Um, uh, some of you may know that on a quasi-annual basis, we would bring summer students and uh, with ethics approval, um, uh, longitudinally follow uh, these patients uh, on, a, on a prospective basis. And this finally has as bare fruits, and we now have a complete follow-up on the entire cohort of 510 patients at 6.1 years, which shows excellent uh, survival at 10 years, considering that the average age of these patients is 64 years of age and with 90.3% survival at 10 years, and very, very low incidence of major adverse cardiac events here, such as revascularization, which is the green line, or myocardial infarction. Uh, so again, uh, um, results beyond what was hoped for uh, and knock on wood uh, that will continue and, and lead to a wider adoption of this procedure. Now, the last question, is it truly less invasive? Uh, and this is a picture of a skeptic. And there are skeptics even in my community uh, and even in my institution uh, who don't believe that uh, this small incision is better for the patient than cutting the entire breastbone. And I respect that opinion. Again, going back to that paper I was showing you before, the six months, quote unquote, price to pay uh, with bypass surgery. Can we address that? And, and, and this is a picture of our uh, resident Minguo who's spearheading the efforts around the, the mistrial. Uh, the mistrial is the minimal invasive versus sternotomy coronary artery bypass grafting trial. Uh, the trial is about half way through its recruitment. COVID obviously is not helping. But the premise of the trial is that let's, uh, rather than have a trial of 3,000 people that would look at whether there are differences in hard outcomes, which would be essentially impossible to power for, let's look at a quality of life endpoint. And, and the idea for this uh, came from uh, reviewing that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, comparing two uh, spine orthopedics techniques and essentially using quality of life or the physical component of the short form 36 a summary score as the primary endpoint of the trial. So we thought, well, this is a continuous endpoint. This is good. It's quite economical as opposed to a dichotomous endpoint. Can we not do this uh, for to look at whether recovery is faster with uh, minimal invasive 
versus sternotomy. So that was the design behind the, the mistrial. And, and we use as a primary endpoint of the trial, uh, the SF36 PCS physical component score at four weeks post-op. Secondary endpoints will include uh, safety endpoints such as major adverse cardiac uh, events. But I think we now have a good sense that these are probably uh, not, not likely at all to be more frequent uh, than with conventional cabbage, uh, showing, uh, uh, knowing now the results that I showed you a few minutes ago. So we're about halfway through our, our recruitment. This is truly an international uh, trial with centers in, in Germany, the US, Canada, India, China, uh, and Japan and Singapore. So I'll conclude here uh, by uh, thank you for your attention. And, and, and again, um, summarizing that mixed cabbage is really a full bypass operation, but without sternotomy, uh, with the same graft configuration as open multivessel bypass using conventional or multi arterial grafts, independent or wide grafts. The robotic uh, approach and, and, and capacity to expand this operation uh, cannot be underestimated. And we're now getting into the next phase of this operation by incorporating the robot. Uh, it appears to be an extremely safe and durable operation. And we're now at phase three of developing this type of surgery. And we need to establish the scientific evidence as to the superiority of mixed bypass over a conventional bypass surgery. So hopefully we, we gain uh, more traction from the community, but this is already well on its way. I think many, many surgeons, uh, there's so much uptake of single or multiple non-sternotomy surgery that is seen all around uh, the cardiac surgery community. And uh, you know, surgeons have to know, and we all know, uh, that this is not a small surgery. It's a small incision, but it's big surgery. Uh, it goes by this anecdote, uh, this cartoon that I like, relax, David, it's just a small surgery, don't panic. The patient says, my name is not David. And surgeon says, I know, I am David. And I think this uh, accurately reproduces uh, the stress of the surgeon as she or he embarks in into uh, developing a program of minimal invasive bypass surgery. So I'll stop here and I would like to thank very important partners in this quest over the last 15 years. Uh, this stemmed initially from a large grant. My first grant as uh, was walking through the Heart Institute from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, uh, looking at less invasive bypass surgery. And I wanna reiterate the support of the Crabtree Foundation uh, with our robotic program and our minimal invasive cardiac surgery program as a whole, and uh, also the support of the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, I know of many other centers, other surgeons with their teams of anesthesiologists and nurses come to Ottawa and then try to start the program at their centers and face a roadblock of administration because uh, one tool may cost $500 more than the current tool that they have. I never experienced any of this uh, with the Heart Institute. We were able to put this program together. Obviously, it's not a very costly program, but there was always support from uh, Dr. Messano, who was my chief at the time, from Heather Sherrard, uh, from others, uh, Dr. Roberts, who was CEO at the time. There was never a hesitation that this was good for patients, and it was a major leap forward in decreasing the invasiveness of bypass surgery and cardiac surgery as a whole. I also want to thank here Dr. Lapierre, who was uh, ready in the trenches with me as we started this, Dr. Gleiner, who took on the operation later on, Dr. Chan, who supported the program as a resident, and, and then later on as a, a robotic mitral surgeon, and the entire division of cardiac surgery for the patients and support through this. Division of cardiac anesthesia has been key in developing this program. You cannot do these surgeries if you don't have the very best anesthesiologist helping you at the head of the table. And, and, and that is crucial. And this is something that I emphasize every time I present on this. The vision of cardiology was also very forward thinking in referring patients specifically uh, for this operation in many instances. All cardiac operating room nurses uh, were very, very patient with me as we started this. And, and, and now it's become routine. I mean, we don't even frown upon uh, three or four bypass surgeries being performed by sternotomy. Ed Jordison, our care facilitator, was extremely involved in doing this. And our perfusion department as well has been extremely understanding. Uh, a lot of peer-to-peers would never have happened 
without great teamwork from my assistant, Beth Wallace, and Mrs. Angela Lambert in medical affairs, uh, supported by Dr. Virginia Roth and Dr. Cinder Rezin, uh, department head of, of surgery. You already allowed all these visitors to come. Close to 100 surgeons have come to Ottawa to learn this operation. Dr. Joe McGinn, obviously, who requires no reason to thank him as, as the co-developer of this program on the international scene. And, and now looking at faster recovery, Manica, Panambalem, Ancillaric, Amy, Charlebois, uh, who really are looking at the next steps to send patients home earlier. And also Medtronic. Medtronic has had vision through this. Uh, this was not a uh, money-making platform. It was a forward-thinking platform. Uh, we've always been, Joe and I, supported uh, by Medtronic. It was always the feeling that this was 100% about patients, never about business. And that feeling remains today. And they've been a fantastic partner. And last but not least, I want to thank all 510 mixed cabbage patients and all the surgeons and centers who have adopted this operation. So thank you very much for your attention today, and I'd be happy to uh, take a few questions uh, as, uh, as they come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, great talk. Fascinating. Nice pictures. A lot of humor as well, as usual. Very good. So I think... Um, we have a few minutes. Let me check. Yeah, we have a few minutes for, for questions. And I see, um, actually, first of all, uh, Dr. Demons, of uh, course, offers his congratulations. And he has a question for you, Mark, which actually was one of my questions, too, so it's great. So do you see a role for hybrid approaches with PCI and mean-based project surgery in the same setting? Great question, Rob. Thank, thanks for your support. Uh, so. I think it's an interesting question. There are two ways, there are three ways to do hybrid revascularization, right? You can do the stent first, then the surgery, uh, which would be a small incision, like what I've showed you of the left internal thoracic artery to the artery at the front of the heart, which is called the LED. Uh, so you could do the stent first, then do the bypass. That is not often performed. Typically what we do is the uh, bypass first, then the stent, one or two days later, uh, which seems to be your favorite approach currently in Ottawa. And you're entirely right. You could do both at the same time uh, without a problem. The, the, the only potential issue with that is uh, uh, the need to reverse the heparin often during the operation. So uh, the surgeon would perform the bypass first, and then the cardiologist would come in and implement uh, the stent where it's needed. And then I think there's often hesitation as to whether uh, heparin should be reversed in a fresh stent like that. Uh, and the patient may be a little bit more uh, prone to bleed than if you give heparin two days later after the, the wound is starting to mend a little bit. But, but I think it's a very interesting option. It's a, a very viable one. We have hybrid ORs that will allow us to do it. Um, we'd have to see whether there's a logistic advantage to doing it in the same setting versus Sur the minimal invasive surgery first and the stent one, two days later. Thank you. We have also, I think you yeah. We have also Hassan comments saying that um, cardiac surgeons have different versions for mini invasive surgery. And um, do you think there is a, a barrier to conducting research because of this? Um, different binds from, uh, from other surgeons who have taken a particular version of, of the surgery. And so how, um, um, how did you uh, navigate this question if you had to? And uh, basically, um, yeah, that was the main question from Hassan. Thanks, Hassan, for asking the question. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a good question as well. And, and you know, as surgeons, you have to be risk adverse. There's no fault in being conservative and, and, and saying no to innovation or, or something that may appear uncomfortable or any risky situation, in my opinion. So, so I, I always um, stress that these surgeries, if you are to engage in innovation, uh, first and foremost, it should be safe. Uh, there should not be uh, mortality as a result uh, of an approach because you, you cannot come back from, from uh, you know, a patient who would pass away be because a program is being too aggressive. And obviously, uh, I don't feel that that was ever the case. Uh, but there might have been 
uh, instances perhaps outside of this field in other areas of medicine where this had happened. Um, so conservativeness for a surgeon and, and being circumspect is, is a good trait, in my opinion. Uh, the reverse is not a good trait. Uh, I think you have to be reproducible and you have to be um, almost aim at becoming a boring surgeon, right? Where it's the same in and out and, and simplicity. Uh, this operation initially was very complicated and, and uh, we made it simpler uh, over the years. And I think that is the greatest achievement. And, and you know, to move into minimal invasive uh, venues for surgeons, the operations have to be simple and adaptable and, and they can be taken up by surgeons with some degree of comfort and above all safety. So I think we close to the end. I have a, I have a question for you, uh, a very simple one, and then a little bit more complex one if you have to. The number one is, okay, now you are the world or one of the two world experts in these operations in the last 15 years. So how, what's the percentage in your practice of this operation when you bypass surgery? So how could you move up the, the, the percentage from the beginning to now? So how many, how many cases out of the number of blood bypass you? The second one is, um, this is basically minimally invasive coronary surgery. Try to squeeze in the, the regular open heart coronary surgery, which is very established with producible results, and the PCI, which is also very established and with reproducible results. So do you have any, any kind of a specific operation and that may include hybrid revascularization that can address this diffusibility, dissemination and reproducibility? Yeah, there are great questions, Thierry. Uh, to answer your first, I think, you know, if this surgery, um, let's say one of us doing the surgeries in the US, you probably end up doing it the whole time because there would be national referrals. And we have national referrals here from coast to coast for the surgery, as you know well. Uh, but I think the reality of being in an institute that provides care to everybody that we're all uh, dealing with and, and, and privilege to serve, right? Uh, mandates that out of my elective bypass populations about 50% or so. And I, I think that's a good number. I think, you know, the, the other 50% uh, may for reason X, Y, Z not be good candidates. And it's really not about doing it on everybody. Uh, that's one of the beauties here of the Canadian system and the Heart Institute is you, you don't have commercial quote unquote pressure to be doing this on every single patient. I think you can, uh, you can offer a boutique surgery if a patient really needs it. And we've certainly offer this surgery to patients after amputations or tracheostomies or other reasons like this. Uh, but otherwise, it should really go to a patient who will benefit from a less invasive approach. Uh, your second question is, essentially, you're asking what is the future of coronary surgery, right, in, in, in different so ways. How many people will still get to stenotomy in 25 years? That's true, yeah. And, and I doubt that it's going to be a majority. Like right now, you know, our institution, as you know well, performs probably about 1,600 open heart surgeries per year and about 300 structural hearts. Uh, make no mistake, that's, uh, <laughs> it's not going to be in 15 years, 1,600 sternums that are open like this. I, I, I just cannot begin to believe that it will be. I tell our trainees and, and, and they agree that it's absolutely essential that they start thinking of the, out of the box and perform some non-sternotomy operations. And I would say the prime candidate is at least be proficient at putting a mammary artery onto the LED. So doing the single bypass to the front of the heart. And, and I think the, the adoption rate for that is very, very high. And most advanced centers have at least one surgeon who can now offer this operation. So great progress from where we were 15 years ago. So basically there is a room for uh, dissemination. Maybe not everyone can do a triple vascularization like you do, but maybe more surgeons to be doing like a, a single uh, lead down VLAD using a exactly. robot or, and then having PCI and having, this is probably the operation of the future. Thank you so much. So I think that, well, first of all, this is important to have uh, surgeons like Dr. Huel who foresee the future and they pioneering against all odds and, uh, and winning against the, 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 the obstacles. So thank you so much. We just passed one. So 
Uh, again, a great talk, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you for your leadership and pioneering these operations at the Heart Institute. And uh, so I wish everybody a very good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.